Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Geek Wave. This is the low-budget show. It's the show so low it has no budget. We're back at it, folks, for a fun edition of, oh, shit, I didn't have a topic planned out, so we'll talk about news in a movie. That's right. We're talking Knock at the Cabin, which is, I guess, a big deal. It, it does seem like a big deal, in my opinion, to, like, you know, the movie that beat Avatar this week. Kind of exciting. And we'll talk about the DC stuff, which is, of course, some of the most important news I think we could talk about. The thing about that is, like, I was always going to talk about it. I was like, of course I have to talk about this. It's exciting. I am still skeptical. So much is interesting about this, but I still don't know how it's going to play. That kind of stuff. But here's the thing. Here's what I've been thinking about it anyways. It's just like, everyone else has talked about it. Am I going to add anything new to the vocabulary? Maybe not, but nonetheless... I'm going to try to talk about it. So that's what we're here to do today. We'll talk about the DC news, talk about Knock of the Cabin. But before any of that, we do have a couple pieces of news to talk about that was spread around the internets for a bit. Some interesting stuff that I was like, wow, I'm amazed some of this is being revealed and some of it hasn't. So the first piece of news that I do want to talk about, there was a bunch of new Avatar news that was released. Some of the producers were like, yeah, we've planned up to five in the next couple, there's going to be a couple big time jumps, but in The Seed Bearer, which is the third installment, which will be coming 2024, we had a little bit of information drop, and it's kind of interesting just to like, hear this news actually like spread in front of you. So, Una Chaplin, the granddaughter of Charlie Chaplin, an actress in her own right who has never fully found her voice like you you'd think being like that big of a nepo baby she would be able to like lead more properties but she really hasn't she will be the villain of avatar 3 the seed bearer she will play varang who is like the leader of the ash people like the fire tribe of pandora and i'm like okay that's all very exciting now i hope their skin is like red because that'd be really cool <laughs> but I think it's gonna be like, I guess like the most like mustyish, toneless blue imaginable. Either way, it's kind of cool. Like that's exciting, right? I'm I'm generally excited for more Avatar. I really liked the way of water, and I, I've never hated the first movie. This is all very exciting. I think this is gonna be a really cool thing to see. And you know why not? Una Chaplin, she's a strong enough actor who's never really found her footing. I guess that says something about Hollywood, right? You can be the granddaughter of one of the forefathers of Hollywood. Charlie Chaplin could literally be in your family lineage and Hollywood still cannot find a place for you to function. Isn't that amazing? I'm, I'm just blown away by that. I'm just like, wow, crazy stuff. But no, that's kind of cool. No issues with that whatsoever. Awesome to stuff to see. Avatar, more of it's coming. More Avatar for the rest of our lives. Is that a problem? Is that a problem? I'm, I'm generally asking people, is it a problem if James Cameron just made an avatar for the rest of his life? He is 68, so the time these next three are done, he'll be close to 76. So, hell, let him make him forever. I don't really care. I think that'd be fun. Cool move away from that topic here's something that was genuinely shocking to me where i was like this can't be true right how are they actually doing this hulu has renewed hit monkey for a second season genuinely surprising i i remember like that first season came out to no fanfare nobody was really talking about it it was just one of those things that was like dumped onto the service and nobody talked about it and you're like okay so is it good is it good do people like it is it something people enjoy it's like, maybe, but no one's talked about it. But I guess there was enough audience for a second season, which doesn't doesn't really make sense to me. Whatever, but th it looked fine. Like, the first season, it looked pretty nice. I don't think there was anything crazy about it, but, you know, pretty cool stuff all around. I can't complain about any of that. Interesting. Fascinating. I don't know. Not a lot of news this week because, of course, there's the big topic we'll be talking about, which kind of, like, took over the news cycle. So we have one final piece of news that is worth talking about because this is like exactly what I'm kind of hoping for. I, there's a couple of things I want to talk about this piece of news. So Amazon is in negotiations to start a new cinematic experience from the creation of Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips's Criminal series. Now, I love this for so many reasons. 
They're one and done stories that are set in the same universe, essentially. So if you wanted to do this one or that one or pick like the titles you want to turn into a movie, you can do that. Extend some into six episode minis. That's really cool. It's prestigious comic books and the industry knows it's prestigious comic books. So we're allowing ourselves to say that's prestigious. I think that's really cool. And last week we kind of talked about like the Fraction and Duconic stuff that Amazon was working on. It seems like Amazon's the place where it's like, we really did bank with the boys and Invincible. So if we keep getting these projects from books people like, like Sex Criminals, like Bitch Planet, like all of Brubaker's criminal series, you can imagine there's some cool stuff going in there. I don't even know where to begin talking about the criminal series on here. I, I've always been like, should I review some of the books? I'm like, no, it's probably easier if I just be like, hey. There's the original criminal series. There's all the mini series inside that. There's Femme, there's the Femme Fatale series, which is a really good one too. And there's just like he works in like some other creators like Steve Epting, which made one of my favorite comic books of all time, which is Velvet. And Pulp just came out recently. They have another one they're working on. There are so many books in like that genre of Brew Baker where it could literally be like the equivalent of you know like always doing like a Grisham book or or doing like a Hannibal series where everyone comes back to that world it's amazing that now someone has finally said there is something to talk about here that's really cool I'm so happy that this is going forward I hope it goes forward because there's so much stuff to play with in that regard I think we're gonna see it I think that's really awesome and that's all the news we have. So we'll take a quick break when we come back. I guess we'll talk about the big stuff. The stuff you're here to hear me talk about. Yep, folks, we're at it again. For the, I'm going to say, hmm, now I'm starting to think. I don't know what my general like demographic is. But I'd say if you are over the age of 10, yeah, let's say 10 to 12, this is about... The third major time the DC Universe slate of movies has, like, redone itself. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that exciting that it happens every... Like, it's just really cool to me that we can exist in a time where, like, these movies just keep trying and never work. I love that. I think it's great. And what I love about this even more is, like... Isn't all of HBO Max kind of like maybe shutting down and becoming something from Discovery Plus? And I love that. It's like, is the Discovery merger still popular enough to work? I love all of that shit because it's like, is any of this real? What are we doing here? Now, this one, I, I, I say has more traction than the last one. But I also said that about the last one. And you could say that about the last one. So the truth is, this one inspires hope that this is going to be good like this new slate of movies that they've announced but i'm also like is it like they tried enough already where i think there is something interesting here but i don't have like my teeth sinking into this where i'm like yes finally we have exactly what we've been waiting for our whole lives good dc content we don't really have that but you know it, it looks good you know, Safran and Gunn, they held a conference uh, the last day of January, which was about a week ago from the time of this video going live. Brought all of, like, the press into this nice little room. Looked very quaint. I know people online were like, they really have no money. They're just doing this in a stupid room. Marvel rents out a whole stadium. Here's what I'm going to say to that, just really quickly. You look at both of the pictures that you see for, like, here's Marvel giving you a big stadium where people come on stage to talk about their shit, to DC putting you in a room. I like the DC one more because, one, those chairs looked way more comfortable than the chairs we see at, a, like, a big panel thing. And, two, it's more personal. This isn't about, like, this movie's coming out right now. We're already working on it. It's like, we might do these. And I think that's awesome. Very fun. So, they announced 10 projects that are in development of some kind, not filming or in pre, just like we are working on these. These are where our heart's desires are at the moment for the future of the DC universe, which is kind of exciting. Again, it doesn't, like, make me jump with joy, but I'm like, okay, I like all of these. There is something about this lineup that feels very, like, innovative, where it's trying to just explore new opportunities and maybe do something a little bit different than just standardized storytelling. So that's kind of fun. 
So this first chapter, which will, I guess, start at 2025. They, they, they haven't really specify like what the first movie is. They, they did say it was like the Superman one, but it's also like the Flash movie will reset it. It's possible Blue Beetle and Aquaman are going to be in that universe. But here's the thing about that. It's like, are they? Why would they? They could just be saying that so you go see these movies that they need to do good money so you can actually make the movies that are on this list as well. I don't know. It's, it's very weird stuff going on. It's always weird at Warner Brothers. You know, I was just thinking about this the other day too because I was uh, I watched Babylon again, which is like my favorite movie ever made in the history of cinema. And I was, I'm was i reading this book called uh, Old Hollywood, which is really fun, like the oral story of Old Hollywood, a very fun story. I, I recommend everybody check out. It's a new book by Jeannie Bessinger and Sam Weissen. And it talks, I, I've just read like this chapter on like the history of like the old studios and who was like the head of them. And I just, I just can imagine Warner Bros. being one of the original like studios in Hollywood doing good because Warner, like Jack himself ran it like it's like a like a fucking military, right? And then they just see all the shit that's in constant flux of Warner Brothers selling themselves off every other day. You have to imagine if he saw what became of his studio, he would just be like, oh my God, what is happening? Kind of interesting stuff. So let's get into it. Let's talk about the chapter one, Gods and Monsters, which is the new slate of projects from DC and... We'll start with everything. So James Gunn's kind of like, we're going to have actors play the characters in video games and cartoons and movies and television. Everyone will be crossing over, which I'm like, that's really cool. I, I, do, I don't hate that. We're one step away from it being the case of having them connect in the comic books, which I'm glad they don't because we'd have to reset so much crap. Very exciting to see that, I guess. So the first thing that was announced was the animated seven episode series that James Gunn had written called Creature Commandos. This is based on like an old school comic book that, uh, was it Mateus that wrote this one that created this team? It was essentially like, what if the universal monster adjacent characters were in World War II fighting people? This feels like it's going to be a modern reboot. I think they already talked about like, maybe it's going to be that Waller puts this team together, but they revealed some artwork for it. I don't, I don't really hate it, you know? You have like a guy, a fish lady, a flaming skull. Weasel is there, a robot who's like a World War II army thing. And then Frankenstein and the Bride. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm on board for that. That looks good. Okay. And if we're saying these could cross over, I have no doubt in my mind they're going to cross over Frankenstein and the Bride into something larger. Those characters definitely feel like they would appear in something outside of the cartoon. I don't really care if Weasel does. That doesn't mean anything to me. But it's like, okay, this is a very fascinating lineup. I do like the way all these characters look. If this is like the design we're going for, again, this is just concept art. But if this is the design we're going for, I'm on board. I think there is something here that looks good. I love the look for the bride. I think it looks amazing. I haven't stopped looking at it. It's perfect. Kind of cool. So a weird kind of like Dirty Dozen-esque like Suicide Squad adjacent storyline where we can do things with these characters. I'm on board for it. Seven episodes does seem kind of weird, but it also feels like maybe our budget's going to be a little bit bigger than if we just did 13. So that's kind of cool. Hopefully the, I, I hope they do this thing where like the artwork can switch between genres. And they, they're not just like trapped in one style. Cause that'd be pretty cool to see these different things. And Hey, 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 if this works, if this works, it would be way cooler than a Marvel Zombies show in a really ugly art style, so I gotta commend them for that. Next up, they announced Waller, which was the spinoff from Peacemaker. Viola Davis will return. She will lead the property. They have Jeremy Carver and Crystal Henry working on it from Watchmen and Doom Patrol. And I'm like, okay, that's a great idea. Perfect time for this to be announced because the week... Yeah, the day I'm recording this, actually... No, the day after... Well, I can't remember. Recently, the Grammys... You know, Viola Davis just won her Grammy for her audiobook, making her an EGOT winner. So, yeah, of course, having her lead a show like this is a great idea. I know some people are like, that's lame. It's so dumb. Why would anybody want to see Waller? Well, she's a well-written character, one of the best parts of every interpretation of the Suicide Squad. 
that's why she's getting a movie or a TV show, I mean. But that's very cool. And, you know, characters from Peacemaker are likely to appear in the show. Obviously, her daughter is probably going to be one of the characters, Harcourt probably, because James Gunn wants to employ his wife. That's not me complaining about him hiring his wife for work. I just think it's kind of interesting she was in Black Adam. That's cool. I am doing this in, in like the order that they announced it through like the six minute video they dropped. So it's going to be like TV, movie, 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 TV, whatever, just randomly jumping through whatever comes up. Because after Waller, they announced Superman Legacy, which will be the first movie in like this new wave of stuff, like the first official project. If anything were to actually get greenlit, this probably feels like the one you hear Zaslav was like, we have to do Superman. He's a character that is important. The comic books are pushing Superman. Even if like this entire plan failed, I could see that July 11th, 2025, we would have a Superman movie released. Not much is said, it just that it's like not an origin story, and it's kind of like, what was it? It focuses on Superman balancing his Kryptonian heritage with his human upbringing. He is the embodiment of truth, justice, and the American way. We say a better tomorrow, we say a better tomorrow now, but no way they knew that. He is kindness in a world that thinks kindness is old-fashioned. And I'm like, yep, you said that, okay, you already understand how the character should be written and treated more than Snyder did. But Snyder's like, how does a god find a place among men? It's like, no, he's not a god. He is a man who has the ability to do good, and the world doesn't want him to do good. This movie feels like it's going to be the exact opposite of what everybody who says Superman is lame is trying to do. It's like, he's so overpowered. Well, you've seen terribly written movies, and you've seen analogs for that character in The Boys and Invincible. This is going to be the opposite of that. I guess they're looking for like a 25-year-old actor to fit that range. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of an interesting take. I, I like a young Superman. We can spend some time with him. 15 years down the line, we could do the death of Superman or something. I'm on board for that. Okay, cool. Sounds great. Uh, I'm excited for that. 2025, that's going to come out. Same with the Batman Part 2, which they announced is an Elseworld property. That's exciting. So here, here's just like what we know so far for the year 2025, okay? A Superman movie, a Batman movie, a Fantastic Four movie, and an Avengers movie. And I'm like, yeah, please don't put any more out. Like, that is enough. Like, with that, we don't need to do any more. That, that's, that sells me on everything. Just stop there, please. From there, we have Lanterns, which is a TV series in the vein of two of true detective that's terrestrial based featuring Hal Jordan and John Stewart. These two are going to be leading a, I guess a crime thing that happens on earth that has to like alien stuff in it. And I, I get that. I have no problem with that whatsoever. I think there's something to explore there. Earth is in like their sector. So that makes sense. I was trying to think of like, what would I like to see this be? And I was like, okay, I had a couple ideas for what this could be. I don't think either of them should be like a rookie coming in on the, on the grind. I would like it that maybe John is a little more like looking to find the right answers while Hal's a little more like tired of it. Doesn't matter to me. Here's the, here's like three ideas I had for how this story could spin somewhere. Because these are going to lead into something bigger, I guess. So here's what I was thinking. The first one is they are hunting the Avarice Killer, which is, in my opinion, like Larflees on Earth collecting these hidden gems, killing other Orange Lanterns so he has all the Orange Lanterns himself. I'm like, that could be a fun idea of like stalking this like scary alien whose like lantern rings landed on our planet. That could be fun. Maybe they are hunting a Black Lantern ring and we can set up like Necron and, you know, the Blackest Night stuff. I'm not the first person to have the idea. It's been kind of said all over the internet at this point. But here's one I think that we could generally go to. Because they have these other lanterns appearing in the movie, I wonder if this is going to set up Hal Jordan finding something connected to Parallax. And our first big bad is going to be Hal going from a god and becoming a monster. And we're going to see, like, Hal becoming Parallax... And he's going to be our first major death so we can focus on the new generation of Green Lanterns. And this show is kind of like our introduction to Hal, who was the best of us, becoming the corrupted version of the worst of us. That's my idea. No way that's going to happen, but I thought that was kind of cool. So a Lanterns TV show on board for. Moving away from that, oh man, we have The Authority, which out of everything on this list, 
This one shocked me the most because I was like, the authority, the authority, really? To start off your slate, you want to do the parody? Okay, so I guess they own Wildstorm, which is kind of cool, I guess. So that probably means Wildcats is coming at some point because they'd be remiss if they didn't. But no, it's cool. I guess there's something about this. This feels like it could be their answer to the boys, to the Snyderverse, where it's just like, look at these characters acting the way you all think they do. Look how badass Midnighter is. Look how strong Apollo is. And then they kiss, and then everyone shuts the fuck up, and we can actually get a good authority movie. Awesome. I, I, I genuinely think this is like an interesting idea. I wasn't expecting it so soon in like the chronologically of the DCU. But makes sense. They could they could occupy a really interesting space, and that is seeing this team already be assembled and becoming these like leaders of a dark nation, uh, all a turning to anti heroes or the dark side in a sense. And then when we see the Justice League actually formed, it's like, oh, that's what they don't want to be. So that's kind of cool. Cool. So this 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 next one is the one that excites me the most. I kind of talked about this in other places. Paradise Lost. Now, I can already hear the complaints of like, oh, who wants a prequel to the Wonder Woman stuff? Well, they they said it takes place before the events of the Wonder Woman films. That does not mean, that does not mean Gal Gadot is returning as Wonder Woman. That means this is a prequel idea to the world of Themyscira. And I love this so much. Saying it's a Game of Thrones style drama set on Alfilma Island, I'm like, okay. So much about that I like. I know, I of course, I saw people complaining. Here's why I like it. A budget that big, cool. You are getting in an all-female cast, essentially. So right there, you're drawing in a new audience that is not strictly comic book fans. When you're saying a Game of Thrones-style show with an all-female cast, and because we're on Themyscira, a lot of that cast is going to be queer, you are getting in a new audience and able to explore new characters and new ideas. That's a really cool thing to see. Now, you could have it about Hippolyta. You could have it about the the older generation with, like, Hera actually creating her disciples and having them work to build the island. You can build in, like, the factoring tribe. So we see the ones that go off to the actual, like, Brazilian Amazon. And then the other ones, they go off to here. There's the Escacida. There's, oh, what's the other one? I can't remember. But, you know, they follow, like, different leaders. There is so much to explore here because there is so much to the world of Wonder Woman. And I know people are like, who cares? But I'm like... This is a good idea because this could be a franchise in on itself. If this works and we're like, hey, this faction is splintering off from Themyscira, you have a spinoff with the Escacida. You know, we're doing that kind of thing. It's such a good idea. I love this more than I love any of the other news. Like, this is so cool to me. You could get on all new original cast. You can actually make Themyscira proper, like this peace-loving island. And you could have maybe it ends with Hippolyta creating Diana out of clay and you can play with that you can bring in like the god element and have it be an entire new thing this to me is like you add all the elements of like an old school god story clash of the titans with like the swords and sandal feel that wonder woman and game of thrones have that's cool that's one of the most exciting things in my opinion I love that I love that I love that stepping away from there we have The Brave and the Bold, which is the new movie that will follow Batman and his son, Damian Wayne, who is going to be Robin. Okay, cool. It's going to be kind of based on the run by Grant Morrison, which introduced a lot of crazy ideas. And I'm like, oh, man, dude, you want to show you're doing something different. That's how you do it. There's so much you could explore here. Flashbacks to Bruce in the desert with the Al Ghouls. We could see him meeting Talia. It feels like we're going to put him in the blue and gray to make it different. I'm like, hell yeah. We're going to cast a new actor as Batman. This already kind of brings up like, how old is the kid going to be? How old is Batman going to be? He could be the same age as, you know, maybe a little bit older. So if he was th maybe not even 30, we could just adjust like eight, 28. If he was 28 and he met Talia 10 years ago when he was 18 and that's when he got drugged, I'm like, yeah, okay, that is definitely something we could explore. I think that would be really cool. Kind of awesome. I, I do like that. It's a good idea. New guy. So Pat, Pat I was going to say Pat, man. Pattinson is going to be there and then we're going to see a new guy play him too. That's very exciting. 
And then we are getting another TV show, which is kind of exciting, I got to say. Booster Gold. Like, it's about time somebody did something with that character. There is so much to play with and do. I just did an episode of my show, The Batmaning Of, talking about him. I think it's kind of awesome that he's getting this opportunity. They described it as imposter syndrome as a superhero. And I'm like, hell yeah, that is such a cool idea. He's been talked about forever. John Michael Carter is the best. I think this is going to be a sleeper favorite of a lot of people's. I know, you know, Glenn Powell's kind of already like got his head in the clouds saying, it's not me, it's not me. But I'm like, dude, you'd be perfect. This show is going to be so fun. This could be their answer to whatever Wonder Man is going to look like. And having both of those characters kind of exist around the same time is a really fun and interesting idea to play with. I do like that. I do like that a lot. So that was the last show they had was Booster Gold. But they have two other movies to talk about, and they're very interesting. This is kind of cool. Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, which is literally just taking the Tom King, Bilquis Everly book that came out last year and turning it into a movie. Now, I don't really want to like just sit here and like talk about how good that comic book is. It's been talked about forever. I think it leads into a greater topic that I I love so much more than anything Marvel has ever fucking done. I, I, I've talked about this in other places to people in my real world. This is a really good thing. The thing that DC has done better than Marvel right off the bat with this situation is two things. One, James Gunn has said, we're focusing on writers and directors' visions. Not a connective universe, the visions of those characters. And two, they have made the comic books available for everyone. As soon as this announcement dropped, there was a huge thing from both DC Comics and James Gunn like, hey... Read All-Star Superman, read Batman and Robin by Grant Morrison, read Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, read this Booster Gold book, read Swamp Thing, here's the authority from Warren Ellis, these books are presented to you to read, they have sold out in every comic book store, on Amazon these books have sold out, and the DC Infinite app is giving you the first issue of each book for free. And I'm like, yes, yes, this is what you should be doing, promoting the fucking comic book. This is what I'm expecting to see happen when Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow comes out. We're going to have fucking trades in the cinemas for you to read the comic book. I think we're going to do it. I think we're going there. I have never been more excited in my life for something like that. This book is awesome. It's just a Western in space, man. It is so good. You haven't read it yet. Such a strong book. A hard-edged Supergirl kind of like living her own life and now she has to help people of this planet. It's like, it's awesome. It's a big science fiction-y movie, a space western of all this kind of stuff going on. It's epic on an epic scale. It is so freaking awesome. Great book. Great idea for a movie. Is it going to be Sasha Kaye? I don't know. I guess that depends if they want to keep her. I could see it going another way, especially if we're doing a younger Superman. I think we're going to see Akara around the same age as him. Kind of exciting. Kind of exciting. That's not all, though. We did have one more piece of news to talk about, which is Swamp Thing. So we're going to be getting a Swamp Thing movie. Is it going to be James Mangold? Probably. Looks like it. Cool. Like, are you kidding me? A Swamp Thing movie? We had a great TV show a couple years ago, and we're doing Swamp Thing again? That's how we're going to lead into the magic? Oh, I love it. 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 So much good stuff. So much fun ideas to explore and play with. This is what I'm talking about, man. This is it. This is like, it's exciting. It's cool. I am hesitant because it could all fall apart at a moment's notice. But when you say we're starting our universe, gods and monsters, you're going to see Frankenstein's monster fighting in a war. You're going to see Booster Gold, Swamp Thing, and the Authority. I'm already like, you're doing things that are different, but you're also giving people what they want, like a Superman, a Batman, and Robin, the origin of Wonder Woman, I guess is something people want, and Viola Davis, today's EGOT winner, Viola Davis. I do like all of this news. I think it's very cool. But we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about M. Night Shyamalan's latest, Knock at the Cabin. So knock at the cabin. That's right, folks. M. Night Shyamalan has always been in like a weird place in Hollywood. And, you know, I even questioned turning this episode into, do I just talk about his filmography? I decided not to for one of the sole reasons of, I don't know if I can contribute anything new to the conversation. So I, I guess I'll make my opinions on the guy up front so you understand where I'm coming in when it comes to knock at the cabin. 
I am an avid defender of the Shyamalan world. The guy made a really good, like, early movie in his career, one of his first movies that kind of, like, shaped the landscape of Hollywood, defined his career, and because of that, he's never truly been able to, like, escape his own curse of success. It's kind of like, it's it's an apt comparison, but I, I really put it in, like, it's his Citizen Kane thing. When you make the sixth sense, you have defined something, and you have changed the game in an essence, and then you are always chasing that kind of high through the rest of your career, never truly able to match it or do anything better than it. Very interesting. I say that also knowing that I think Shyamalan has made some really good movies. Now, I'm not saying his entire career is perfect. There are definitely some, like, After Earth, like... The Last Airbender, I, I would even say like Glass that I don't think are really good. But I look at his filmography and I'm never like, oh, this is shit. No, no director has like the perfect like arsenal at their disposal, but he's a fantastic filmmaker. I've I liked old when I watched it. I thought this was something kind of interesting to play with and it's exploring new ideas. And I, I think like the unbreakable and split stuff is fun to an extent it was never something like i loved but i do think he is a, a competent accomplished filmmaker who puts it on the line every time he's a guy who will put another mortgage out on his house to finance his own movie and when you do that you're like why are you doing that you're m night Shyamalan. you should be able to make a mid-budget film pretty effortlessly and then when you do that you're like why isn't that happening it's kind of weird. So he makes Knock at the Cabin based on a Paul Tremblay book. And I'm like, okay, I guess that's kind of in, in like a good range. Now, here's the thing I really think about the movie before we go into it. This film, given reports that I just kind of looked up, it cost $20 million to make. That is a reasonable budget that it's going to make back within a month, easily within a month. The film made, I think, like 13 point something in its opening weekend. It's going to do fine. This film's going to make money. Shyamalan is going to be back on top in essence. And when you see that and you come out of this week and this week in Hollywood, two films for the first time in seven weeks have passed. Avatar, Knock at the Cabin and 80 for Brady. And both of those films have a budget under $30 million. Both of those films are mid-budgeted, yeah, even lower-budgeted films not aimed for the general audience that are exploring different things. Now, I did a review for 80 for Brady. That is a older generation comedy that I think is really fun and creative. And Knock at the Cabin is this kind of like depressionistic horror film that takes itself super seriously and allows its concept to be heartbreaking and hard to watch. And I think that's a very interesting thing that this movie is focusing on is that it's playing with this element that this is not something anybody any of the characters want to be experiencing and it just makes it something a little bit different where you're not, not like ugh, man look at this big waste of time with these actors making this effort it feels intimate and very real and, and look there are elements of this movie we'll get into but it, it's simplistically a realistic betrayal of what would happen in the situation if there were these four people that showed up when you were on vacation with your family and they said one of you has to die so we can stop the apocalypse if that happened to you one of the guys is like batista sized you're going to be scared and if those people were forced into this situation for reasons they don't understand then this is exactly what you'd expect from a movie like this that's what I think connects with. First off, I did really like this movie. I thought it was a very fun flick. I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's the best of Shyamalan's career. It's the best horror movie of the year. It is just a perfect distilled version of how you tell this exact story. You cannot tell this story better. And I don't care if anyone's like, I'm not a, a Shyamalan fan. He's a bad director. You cannot watch a movie like this and tell me the guy isn't a artist because he is making some very creative very inept choices that just make a very fascinating piece this is a very well-crafted movie at every turn i'm just like okay we're doing something creative we're doing something kind of fun i like to see that makes for a really cool piece now the the writing might be the weakest point of this because it's just so like 
obvious writing, if that makes sense. Some writers try to be smart about what they're doing. And when you're doing a story like this where it's a bunch of people sitting around reacting to things, talking about things, making it realistic is the hard part. Now, the, the actors themselves are what make that realistic because everybody is heartbroken at the situation they're a part of in all these different ways, whether it's not believing in themselves, not believing in the situation, afraid of what they have to do, afraid of what's going to happen to them. So much about that is believable and earnest. When it comes to the writing, it is very much just kind of on the nose, but that's fine. I don't think this script had to be, look at how metaphorical and intense we're getting. It's a very simplistic script, and it writes the characters as these obvious things that don't really have depth of motion. The further we get into the story, there are some more things that happen with like Andrew and Eric, our two kind of lead characters, where they are given more depth and given more emotion to deal with. And it makes their situation feel very real and authentic. So I did like seeing that. I don't know if I have like a favorite performance in this. I would say the two best who really show their range in something like this are Ben Aldrich as Andrew, who is breathtakingly clever and subtle in a lot of his portrayals. There is so much aggression in like real world anger built into his performance of this man who, even though he is strong, confident, and competent, and willing to go the extra mile to prove how masculine and tough he is, the world diminishes him because of his sexuality. It's a very smart use of like a same sex couple. And I, I don't want to like linger on that notion too much because I don't think this film is defined by that, but it's also elevated to another level because this isn't just like a standard like attack of these people trying to prevent the apocalypse. The two leads of Eric and Andrew can see this as a home invasion of two openly queer people with an adopted daughter. And that becomes its own bag of worms. And, and then that leads into a whole new idea of these people, connections between some of them as the story progresses. It is very subtle. But also, I, I did walk away from this when I, I saw it with a friend. We both walked away kind of like talking about like, hey, yeah, this movie's kind of about like, triumphing love over the prejudice that is thrown against you, which I think is a very positive message for the LGBTQ community, where it's like, yes, the world's going to diminish you, but be better than them and help them. And that's definitely an angle I think this movie explores, and Ben Aldrich is a great character to show you that. Gruff does a lot of good stuff, too. His work is a little more just, like, quiet and toned down from what we're seeing the other guys do, but he is given a lot to show his range. I've, I've never thought he was like a bad actor, but I've also never been like fully committed to a lot of his other work. With this one, you're seeing why he is strong and capable and able to do these kind of things. It's very cool. You do like it. But look, the standout, and I mean this wholeheartedly, is Batista. Batista gives the performance of his career. I have never thought Batista was bad in any role, but you see a film like this, you see like his core values of, I don't want to be an action hero who is just typecast in those roles. I don't want to be remembered for one role. I want to do interesting work. And you see, like, that is his core belief as an actor. He is doing so much more in this scene than than you're expecting. And it just makes it so compelling to see him. He is such a big guy, but he uses his, like, size to play characters that aren't exactly what he looks like utterly fascinating an utterly beautiful performance and of course you have like Nikki Amaku Bird in here Abby Quinn and Rupert Grint a lot of like you know supporting character work that they do all of them given strong moments to shine now Kristen Chow is that the name of the daughter when she is a young actress of course and when you're a young actress sometimes you know the work's not going to be perfect but she holds herself well with the awesome camera work and story we're seeing developed, she holds herself well. And and I don't know if I want to spoil too much of this movie for you, because it's a very interesting watch when you don't go in knowing anything, but it starts really quick, and you get out really quick. The premise is laid out for you so easily. We don't go to a lot of locations. We kind of stay in one place. We do have, like, some exposition being dropped on a television, but that's the point. And the stuff on the television leads into is this real, is this fake. It goes into a very interesting idea that's kind of fascinating you do like that now there isn't like a Shyamalan style twist that's kind of become like his iconic staying power there's none of that here what we're seeing more of is just what is real and what is fake the ideas of fantasy and reality kind of blending into this idea of like prejudice and hate and love being in this like weird concoction it all works beautifully and makes something very special and very compelling I am 
definitely a fan of this. There's a lot of ideas being explored here, a lot of good stuff on display that just makes this something fascinating and unique and just wholly Shyamalan and wholly closeted and it's just a really tight movie. And that's kind of like what I want to see is like when we're doing something like this, we don't need more than 20 million. We have actors willing to play out this size and do stuff in that capacity and, and that just makes it all the more special. I really think this should be a trend we see going forward in Hollywood, giving auteurs a limited budget to work in their wheelhouse and create something interesting. I know a lot of these guys want to do the next big thing, but if we just gave some of these names smaller budgets, not only would their movies feel more interesting, but they would just show you like the range they used to have. And, and M. Night, if he wants to do another big property, I say let him do it. But if he wants to stick to this range, I'm all for it. Because he had great actors, great writing. I say great writing loosely, but enough to work into his confines and make something that works exactly for his creative endeavors. It's a near perfect movie. Now, I'm not saying it's the best of his career or it's like the best film I've ever seen, but for exactly what this movie wanted to set up and establish, it does that better than most. And I think that's impressive and it, and it makes it wholly unique, wholly original and kind of special. So I do like that. Knock at the cabin. I am going to give an eight out of 10. And that's going to do it for this episode of The Geek Wave. Now, thank you guys so much for watching this episode. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. As always, you can check me out on Instagram, TikTok, and Hive. And I will catch you in the next one. Have fun. Stay safe. Good luck.